going to look at the future of diplomacy in the Gulf. Uh, so among the themes that we're going to be discussing today is the diplomacy that's underway between some of the Gulf Arab monarchies and Iran, and the state of relations between the Gulf states themselves after a turbulent few years where the rift with Qatar uh, caused a variety of complications and tensions within what had often in the past been seen as a fairly fraternal club of Gulf Arab monarchies. Uh, we have a, a wonderful panel with us today um, and delighted to say that we have uh, many of you joining us on Zoom where you will be able to ask us questions and make sure that it's interactive. We're also simultaneously live streaming this on YouTube uh, to reach a, a broader audience and this will be something we can record and, and share with people going forward. So obviously today's event is on the record just to make you aware. Uh, my name is Jane Kinnanmont. I'm your host and moderator for today. I'm Impact Director at the European Leadership Network a network of leaders focusing on security and preventing nuclear war. And I have a particular affection for and interest in the Gulf region, which I've studied for quite a few years. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Rafia Al-Talai, the Editor-in-Chief for SADA at the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace's Middle East Programme, uh, who is from Oman, currently based in Washington, D.C., uh, also by Dr. Dina Esfandiari, who is Senior Advisor for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group, and Michael Stevens, a Senior Research Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and an Associate Fellow for RUSI. Between them, they have great experience uh, across the region uh, and will have a lot to bring to today's discussion. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn over to Rafia, uh, thinking that it's good for us to start with a woman who is from the region to lead our discussion. Uh, and I think we're going to hear from her both about the politics and about the importance of some new thinking in Gulf diplomacy. I'm also just going to remind all of you, if you don't mind muting yourself unless you're speaking, that would be helpful because we're picking up some background chatter from a few people that you might not necessarily want to be sharing uh, on YouTube. No, no, I because Barbara was trying so, to send that text. I will, I, I will hand over to Rafia. Thank you very much for joining us. Of course, um, thank you uh, for the introduction and thank you for everyone is interested in listening to us. Uh, so as uh, Jane uh, mentioned, I would talk about very maybe local, I would say uh, Gulf uh, issues from a different perspective which is related to human rights, women empowerment, and uh, hosting international, um, international events. Um, um, first, I would like to give a little bit background um, why I think what I'm going to say is uh, important or it should be taken into consideration when we talk about the diplomacy in the, uh, in the Gulf or the diplomacy of the Gulf countries. Um, I was, in fact, in Qatar when the uh, Gulf crisis happened. I am a journalist. I was working um, at Al Jazeera that time. Uh, before that, I was working at Sky News Arabia in Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, why I mention that? Because I think a media uh, played a, a big role in um, the very difficult uh, um, relationships we witness now in the Gulf and the mistrust between the Gulf uh, states. Um, as you know, one of the um, demands, 13 demands was for the boycotting uh, countries that uh, closing uh, Al Jazeera because it was, uh, for many reasons, they thought uh, Jazeera should be closed because it was hostile to some of the Gulf countries among other things. Um, and it, uh, so what Qatar did, um, Qatar used all tools of diplomacy. Among, among these things is hosting international um, events, conferences related to human rights and to the freedom of press and freedom of uh, uh, expression. And that was um, 
a very successful, I have to say from what I saw, it was very uh, successful tool because Qatar could uh, gain the international sympathy and uh, could maybe with the tools uh, used could stop uh, military intervention from um, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates at, as it was predicted that time. Uh, Al Jazeera, Sky News Arabia and other, they were uh, major in this fight. Um, they were using the tools that the state not using directly in attacking each other, in investigating issues, in um, issues they are uh, important and issues are minor, issues are not important, but there was um, a huge amount of attack from uh, both sides. But I have to say that Al Jazeera, all of them, they were state directed. I, wa I don't want to say they were free and they were doing that out of, uh, you know, just feeling loyal. But of course, loyalty played uh, also a role in, in, in the behavior of the uh, media network. But um, Al Jazeera was very much um, cautious and careful not to attack Saudi Arabia, particularly um, as it was attacking United Arab Emirates. Um, uh, um, the media on the other side was uh, attacking every aspect, every person, everything in Qatar. And um, I th um, and that created a lot of hostility between the people uh, because they were themselves involved even in the social media in attacking each other. Um, because of the state media, state controlled state media and state owned or private were so much investing in this uh, crisis, in attacking each other, the people felt that some of them without orders or uh, directions, um, they felt they should join. But um, some of them in fact were forced to do that, especially uh, famous people. And um, that made feeling between, you know, the, the people who are relatives, you know, in these countries um, feel um, I don't want to say only very bad, but it was shocked. Um, some of them, as you know, were uh, in jail, like Salman al Ouda, until now, because he asked people to calm down and to reconcile and to reconsider because they are relatives and uh, all the history between them. But until today, this person is in the jail just because he was moderate. So, I don't want to stay in that area very um, long, but I would like to say that even though after Al Ula summit and the reconciliation, I don't think that helped a lot uh, the people in um, reconciliation and in having, you know, I don't want to say the feeling, but the relation as, as they were before the crisis. Um, what Gulf crisis um, created between these countries is mistrust more than cooperation. All of you know the GCC is created as a, a cooperation foundation, but, uh, and they did have, of course, some dispute about the borders. Um, this is not the first, uh, in fact, um, uh, disagreement or uh, crisis, but this one went beyond everyone else in the Gulf region expected uh, in terms of, um, you know the the uh, the attacks, the um, uh, the goals of it, and then um, uh, the length also of it, because it stayed um, uh, years, in fact, not only months. So, um, saying this, I think there is room for the Gulf state in the future to use um, tools that would help. Um, a lot in solving or in mitigating the, um, the tension between the governments and between the, pe the people as well, and enhancing and improving the international image. All the Gulf country um, want, countries want to um, uh, deliver to the world, want to convince the world that they are these countries. So, in this um, context, um, everyone or mo most people around the world, they know about the Gulf state, these facts that they are 
rich, stable monarchies. And so people would like from around the world to go, for example, to work and um, and live uh, in the in the Gulf. But also what is in the minds of the people um, around the world, including the people in the Gulf, what is wrong about these countries? Um, it's there actually um, records in human rights, um, women rights, and uh, including the uh, limited um, uh, freedom of expression and uh, freedom of press. Um, when I mentioned, um, and specifically for many in the world, they talk about the treatment of foreign labor specifically in the Gulf. And that might, um, I wouldn't say might, but it did actually um, uh, spoil the reputation of the Gulf um, um, in um, many events. Like now when we witness Qatar is um, preparing for the World Cup, still there are um, organizations and media network would focus on the rights of the uh, of the laborers uh, uh, laborers uh, uh, for the for the foreign laborers in, in Qatar and they want um, the their working conditions to be enhanced um, so um, talking about this the Gulf states also in the other hand they try hard to look good in many ways uh, um, in the eyes of the world by trying always to score best in the uh, reports, uh, international reports re related to many things like transparency, like happiness, like, uh, you know, uh, life uh, uh, living um, uh, le uh, level, like uh, uh, the, the good living, the uh, GPD, the uh, women empowerment and hosting a lot of international um, conferences and events, um, which I mentioned that Qatar was in this path from the beginning, even before the, the Gulf crisis. So they could utilize this during the Gulf crisis. And then they actually, it was successful to gain, to gain the sympathy of the world um, for Qatar during the Gulf crisis. And now Oman is hosting the um, International Federation Journalist con Congress, the annual Congress. It will be in the, uh, by the end of next month. And um, it's good because for the country because it um, brings the attention to this country in one hand, which Oman was avoiding um, for many, many years. And it was, even for myself, it was a surprise that Oman is hosting um, this, uh, uh, con uh, this Congress um, this year. And I was also surprised that this, um, the Federation is actually um, agreed to host this, um, uh, their annual Congress in Oman this year. For the same reason, I was surprised that Qatar hosted it during also the, the same this co uh, Congress uh, during the Gulf crisis, because I don't think these countries, um, their records in the freedom of press is really good. But in the other hand, <laughs> in the other hand, maybe, Maybe these international, that's what I think, um, what the international community can do, an international organization can do to put more pressure or to put the pressure by bringing the attention to these countries to enhance their records in uh, human rights, in, in um, the giving more freedom uh, to the press, to the uh, freedom of expression. And by uh, hosting these, um, these conferences, the Gulf states and now Oman wants to look, you know, um, that they are um, <clears throat> uh, aligned with international community, uh, aligned with the, you know, the requirement of being part of this community by giving uh, people, the press, uh, you know, more freedom to express themselves and to um, um, uh, criticize the, uh, the, um, government, uh, you know, policies talked about them, uh, give them uh, a free platform under the protection of the law. Um, uh, if these international organizations don't do this, I don't think there is, um, there is, uh, um, it's useful uh, in any way, but to, uh, you know, promote the states and to be another propaganda for these states and for these uh, governments, if 
there is no um, uh, seen value in terms of trans um, in terms of transition to a more um, let's say free, relatively free, uh, you know, um, uh, environment uh, that protect and respect the freedom of expression and freedom of press. Now, another tool the Gulf states uh, use is like women empowerment. They are, um, all of them, in fact, proud to show how many women uh, they are in this sector, how many women ambassadors, how many women ministers, and how many women in leadership. But in fact, um, um, anyway, the number is still, I don't want to talk only about the number. The number is still very uh, little if we compare it to all uh, standards in the world. And, but, the Gulf state, they do care. They want to look still, they, they are very keen to look nice and that they give women their rights and um, you know they give them the opportunity to, um, uh, to be in a leadership and decision-making uh, position, but also um, the role of the international um, community uh, through the uh, through independent organization or maybe through uh, government who uh, care uh, governments who care um, uh, to put pressure that women empowerment it's not only few women who are from um, from the elite and from uh, ruling class most of the time or from the tribes and the families that are loyal uh, to the ruling families um, because that is what is happening in the Gulf. Uh, second, uh, women empowerment is changing the laws, the discriminatory laws against women, and that women wouldn't be empowered if the laws still discriminate between them and their male counterparts, that uh, laws they are not um, uh, 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 equal, uh, uh, a law that doesn't treat them as equal citizens like, uh, like males. I think, as I said, um, Gulf state can do this because, you know, first, the population is not too high. Um, second, uh, women are educated and even they are more educated than, male, uh, male, uh, than the males in, in these countries. So it's only hierarchy. It's only patriarchy. It's only, um, you know, um, um, uh, uh, considering uh, females as a second class citizen is it is the culture of the government and the culture of the society. And I think, but um, um, being um, um, a monarchy and the decision-making is comes from um, up down, it's always decision of the ruler, it's always decision of the, uh, the person or the people around uh, him in this case, uh, to have more women, less women, uh, where and uh, when. So it shouldn't be real problem um, if they are convinced that women are in fact equal uh, citizens to the male. I think this one tool would help to uh, give the Gulf states um, even um, uh, more uh, credit. Now, if I want to talk about human rights in general, um, I would like to go back a little bit to the example of Jamal Khashoggi, for example, in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, of course, it's uh, um, uh, the richest country in the Gulf and um, uh, the biggest and uh, with all its history, which you all know, um, Jamal Khashoggi incident was big and huge and is still impacting the image of the country in many aspects, um, uh, even politic uh, politically. Um, so, um, Ignoring uh, incidents like that um, um, by governments, let's say by states, um, shouldn't um, be followed by uh, also ignorance or not um, um, uh, not follow up from uh, other international um, uh, organizations and foundations that can, uh, in fact. Um, uh, Put pressure either to the, uh, on their governments or to the Gulf states themselves when there are there are some opportunities like international, I said, conferences or other events or um, United Nations and you know the, there are many advocacy groups and research, in fact, um, institutions which highlight a lot of uh, uh, these issues. 
Um, finally, I know I, I talked uh, maybe a little bit more than 10 minutes, but so for the Gulf states, by looking internally and, you know, focusing on uh, human rights, uh, women empower empowerment, and hosting. I use these, why? Because these, the, uh, these things are among their favorites. They think these are easy and soft, uh, you know, tools. I wouldn't go to democratic transition and being serious about the elections and transforming the councils, like Shura councils, to a real parliaments. They're, these are um, important and serious. And also what I'm saying, I think is serious, but it's steps and easy steps, and maybe we can say baby state, uh, baby steps. It doesn't depend on the society when they want to blame people and blame the culture. No, it depends on the um, on the ruling uh, class, on the ruling person in, in, in particular, and um, they can make this decision. So, for the Gulf state to go a little bit um, farther, or let's say forward from the competition uh, between them. To more cooperation and between distrust to stress, they in fact can have um, um, a mutual project uh, since they are still in this cooperation of the Gulf uh, Council to um, first enhance and improve their um, uh, image uh, internationally uh, by you know utilizing the tools they've been using in promoting youth, promoting women, human rights, not promoting human rights, at least respecting human rights. And then they can um, uh, change, they can change. They have a lot of laws which is similar to each other. They copy each other. So they can also copy each other in a more positive um, and uh, equal and fair laws. Um, I think uh, I want to stress the, the last thing I want to say that international independent uh, organization can put a lot of pressure because the state, the Gulf state, they do actually care about their ranking in the international reports, whether related to transparency, related to, you know, uh, democratic transition, free, party, party free or not free, they really care. So um, I think organization like yours maybe um, can do a lot if the government choose not to do or not to put that pressure to uh, enhance the lives of the people in the United uh, in, in these Gulf states. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafia. It's wonderful to really hear a point of view on how the internal developments affect soft power projection and diplomacy and the potential for diplomacy to create some virtuous circles. I'll turn now to Dina Esfandiari from the International Crisis Group, who will take us more into the current geopolitics in the region, looking in particular at the role of Iran, the impact of the JCPOA if it's coming back, uh, and some of the talks that have been taking place between Iran and Gulf Arab neighbours. So over to you, Dina. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you, Jane, and thank you um, for having me with uh, with you all. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, I'm going to take things a little bit more regionally, as uh, as Jane just said. Um, we've witnessed uh, a little bit of a push for dialogue and engagement in the region, um, which is good news. So the the question that I often get posed is, are we now heading for an era of pragmatism in the region? Um, uh, I would argue yes, to a certain extent. Um, and I think there are several reasons for that. Uh, first is um, the perceived disengagement of the US from the region and the, the impact of, um, of American policies like the maximum pressure campaign uh, under President Trump, where the policy was intended to, to curb Iranian um, influence in the region uh, through a much more aggressive approach to Iran. Um, while the Gulf Arab states initially supported that policy, they thought it was a good idea, they really got behind it. Um, over time, they saw that actually it didn't help them much. Uh, in fact, uh, it, was, it was really quite frightening because Iran ended up lashing out a lot more in the region. And when it did lash out, there was no America to help them fight off Iran lashing mm -hmm. out in the region. Um, I think COVID uh, helps explain some of this pragmatism. Uh, it became apparent that a virus was no longer was could not be limited to state borders, um, which meant that if uh, you found yourself in a country that was dealing with the virus pretty well, but just across um, across the border, 
things were uh, things were going pretty poorly, but inevitably it was going to impact your ability to deal with it as well. So that kind of fostered um, uh, not necessarily a desire, but a willingness to uh, to at least engage a little bit more um, with other countries in the region, or and and even go so far as to assist other countries in the region. I'm obviously talking about Iran. Um, when, uh, w as a result of the, the pandemic. Um, I think the JCPOA is also leading to this, to this era of pragmatism. Um, we've found ourselves in a little bit of a stalemate, uh, to put it diplomatically. The, the Biden administration took its time to return to the negotiations. Uh, and then the new Iranian administration, the Raisi administration, took its time to return to the negotiating table. The asks on both sides um, in terms of uh, returning to the deal just didn't match. Iran was looking for U.S. guarantees uh, that it wouldn't leave the deal in the future and obviously for the lifting of all sanctions, um, while the U.S. Uh, for its part was asking for an expansion of talks. Um, uh, it was talking of a JCPOA plus once all the parties were able to return to the, to the JCPOA itself. Um, neither Iran nor the US could commit to, to what was being asked of them. And then today, uh, because most of those issues have now been resolved, today we're now stuck on this issue of lifting the um, designation of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards by the US. Um, the US side has made it clear that they will, they've now taken a decision not to lift that designation because I think the, it, it would just be too costly for them domestically, even though, frankly, the impact, the impact of lifting that designation really wouldn't be that great because, um, because the Revolutionary Guards are, are sanctioned quite heavily anyway. Uh, so the designation is really quite symbolic. And on the Iranian side, they've decided that this is the hill they're going to die on for now. Um, they absolutely, uh, for, for reasons of, of pride, uh, perhaps as a result of the killing of General uh, Qasem Soleimani by the Americans um, a couple of years ago, they, they've just decided that this has to be done um, before they can agree to, to returning to the JCPOA. So we're stuck, you know, it's not making any progress. Uh, and why is this fostering, oddly enough, pragmatism? Well, because I think there's a growing realization in the Gulf Arab states that with a JCPOA, Iran is at least at the beginning likely to also lash out in the region, much like it did um, after the agreement in 2015 initially, because it will feel like it will have to respond. It made a compromise, it returned to the deal. So now, you know, I have to, I have to show something for it. I have to lash out in the region. But without a deal, it will also do that. It is also likely to lash out in the region, not because it feels it has to take a stand because it made a compromise, but because it feels it will have to teach the international community a lesson because they did not agree um, along with Iran to return to the nuclear deal. And I think there's a, there's a growing understanding of these dynamics in the Gulf Arab states. And uh, because they feel that the US may not necessarily deal with it in a way that they uh, entirely comfortable with, I think they've decided to take matters into their own hands and, and deal with this likely um, scenario themselves by engaging with Iran directly. Um, I think the Gulf Arab states have also understood that divisions are making them weaker. Uh, it took a little bit of time, but, uh, but they are, again, increasingly realizing that if they work as a group, uh, at least externally facing. So they, they might not necessarily be able to agree on much amongst themselves. And, and as Rafai pointed out, there are still significant divisions amongst themselves. But at least outward facing, it is, it is perhaps better for them to pretend to work as a group rather than as individual states. Um, and so we've ended up in this, in this uh, kind of scenario that we're in right now, where we've seen pockets of dialogue emerging throughout the region. Um, and obviously I will talk a little bit more about the ones with Iran, uh, but it is important to note that so far um, in most cases, the dialogue has been pretty limited. Uh, the exception obviously is, uh, is the dialogue that we saw between Turkey and the UAE, uh, potentially Turkey and Saudi Arabia now, given that Erdogan is in, is in Riyadh today. Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and that dialogue has been limited to really just de-escalation. Um, certainly the dialogue with Iran has been uh, that way. So 
quickly, just to go over what's been happening um, between Saudi Arabia and Iran and the UAE and Iran, um, the talks between the Saudis and the Iranians have um, part of the reason for their success is because they are a deep state conversation. It is no longer just an administration on the Iranian side talking to the leadership in Saudi Arabia, but really there's there's on the Iranian side, the supreme leader has given his okay for this dialogue to go ahead. And so you have multiple levels of individuals within the Iranian system um, talking, talking to the Saudi side, which is actually reassuring um, for the Saudis because they're now... From their perspective, they're like, okay, we're talking to we're talking to the relevant officials. It doesn't matter who is in power in Iran um, and on the president's side, but at least we are talking to the the guys who really make the decisions. Um, at least that's the case from their perspective. This this conversation, of course, it's welcome, but it hasn't made much progress um, over the course of the last few months. Um, they were actually put on hold uh, last November. That's when they had um, the, the, the meeting before the one that they just had last week. Um, they were put on hold pending the formation of a government in Baghdad <laughs> initially. Uh, and then last month, Iran decided to suspend the talks uh, after Saudi Arabia executed um, several Shiite dissidents. Um, so the Iranians wanted to, or at least that was the excuse they used. They wanted to send a message to Riyadh. Um, and then uh, quite abruptly, that suspension was, was overturned uh, and Iran and Saudi Arabia met last week in, um, in Baghdad uh, to discuss um, the Yemen crisis and a potential normalization of their ties. Um, they, are also, uh, they are also talking about um, there being uh, further meetings, which I think is good news. They're talking about a lower level meeting um, in Oman to take place in a couple of weeks before there is another round at a high level meeting in Baghdad. All of this again is, is, is great news. Dialogue for the sake of dialogue in a region uh, rife with instability where people really do not like each other, again, put diplomatically, um, is welcome. It's good because it's additional face time. It means that you, know, you get used to, to the way the other person communicates and it's, and it's always welcome. But the problem is the dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia is kind of stuck right now. Um, again, the asks don't match. The Saudis want the Iranians to stop arming the Houthis and the Iranians, uh, from their perspective, that's something that might come as a result of several round of talks, but it definitely isn't going to be something that would happen at the beginning of a dialogue because from their perspective, that's their trump card. Um, and then the Saudis want Iranian help to, to control and roll back the Houthis, which is something that Iranian officials have said they're, they're willing to help on. The problem is how much control do they really have over the Houthis? Could they really deliver on right. this? So when you talk to Iranian officials, they'll tell you, well, we're happy to talk to the Houthis and ask them to pull back or, or to not um, carry out additional offensive. But ultimately the Houthis have their own grievances and their own objectives. Um, and so it's difficult awesome. for us to control them. Um, so the Saudis uh, kind of feel obligated to continue the talks, but they're not too happy with them. They, they want to prove to the world that they want to continue talking. Um, and so, you know, they want to continue to engage, but they also feel, uh, and perhaps rightly so, that as long as they engage the Iranian side, Iran won't carry out any direct strikes against Saudi Arabia. So it's like a form of deterrence for them to, to maintain this dialogue. And from the Iranian perspective, um, they were initially a lot more pragmatic about these, this dialogue. Uh, they understood that it was going to take time, that it was, there, were, there was a lot of um, tension and differences to get over. Um, but, and they want actually a reopening of, of uh, diplomatic ties first before they move on to other things. And they've, and like I said, they've shown a willingness to deal on Yemen, but they feel a little bit constrained about what they can actually uh, compromise on and, and give um, in this dialogue. But I think they've, they're also getting increasingly frustrated. Um, and I think we saw that with, uh, with the, their suspension last month. They did say it was because of the execution of the Shiite dissidents, um, but I suspect that the, the motives for the suspension were also just to send a message to say, look, we need to get a move on this. 
Um, you know, talking for the sake of talking isn't really getting us anywhere. Um, so it was both a message to the Saudis, but also perhaps a message to the to the rest of the international community that's engaging with it on the on the JCPOA to say, look, it's easy for us to stop our policy of engagement that we are currently on. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a little bit of a dig to the rest of the international community. So that's for Iran Saudi, and then very rapidly on on Iran and the UAE. Those conversations, uh, again, um, limited, de-escalatory. They began uh, through a discussion on maritime issues during the maximum pressure campaign, and they kind of continued and grew um, in particular after Iran threatened uh, Dubai directly, uh, again, during the maximum pressure campaign. The Emiratis felt that they had to take matters into their own hands, and they kind of developed a like a two pronged approach to dealing with Iran, which frankly was long overdue. Um, so yes, they would continue to contain Iran, which remains their policy, but they decided that they would engage it as well, um, and that engagement was really uh, really targeted towards ensuring that they had a line of communication to de escalate if things got out of hand. Um, and so uh, we saw uh, various you know, Emirati individuals. The most notable was Sheikh Tahnoun's visit to, to Tehran, which happened a few months ago. This was you know, unusually public. Um, normally, his visits tend to go under the radar. And it was, again, I think, a, a sign that that dialogue was um, likely to go beyond administration, similar to the, to the Saudi one. There's much, much like in, the, in Saudi, the Emiratis also have a, a real mistrust of the presidential system in Iran uh, and the changes in the political landscape that you see in Iran. So there was a desire to engage on a, on a deeper level and to ensure that no matter what happens on the political level in Iran, you would have that consistency of engagement with the, with the deep state. Those, that dialogue faced a real test earlier this year with the Houthi strikes in, um, in the UAE, uh, targeting various uh, uh, places in, in Abu Dhabi, basically. Um, there was a, a real risk that things would get out of hand, but actually um, both parties were quite good and quite careful about compartmentalizing that dialogue from those attacks, downplaying uh, the attacks publicly, um, despite the fact that the UAE also was very clear that it would address this kind of uh, this kind of attack um, quite forcefully. Um, and they used their dialogue to to deescalate, which is exactly what dialogue is meant to be for. Um, and so I think in this instance it actually worked quite well. They uh, the Emiratis made it clear to the Iranians that you know they would continue engaging with them because it made sense. Um, they also made it clear to the Iranians that they thought, that those attacks could not be carried out without Iranian uh, knowledge at the very least, and certainly couldn't have been carried out um, without Iranian weapons. So it also became a way um, for the Emiratis to communicate exactly what they knew, exactly what they thought, uh, while they were de-escalating um, the crisis and ensuring that it wouldn't get, thing, wouldn't get out of hand. So I really think that that is an example of why dialogue is necessary uh, in our region, um, and, and why these pockets of communication that are emerging are perhaps super slow moving, but really, really important. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Dina. Fabulously up to date and fascinating. I'm going to turn now to Michael Stevens of the Foreign Policy Research Institute and, and an associate fellow at RUSI. Uh, where he used to run uh, Rusi's office in Qatar and spent a few years in the Gulf in that role, a uh, rather wonderful office, which I remember had its own little majlis. Um, Michael, I'm hoping that you might also tell us some things about the international relations of the Gulf and the uh, current seemingly quite frosty relations between some of the Gulf countries and the, the US, um, perhaps how they are responding to the Russia invasion of Ukraine, um, but over to you to brief the group. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And I, I'm, I'm going to try and give a as different an angle as I can on this, because, you know, obviously I agree a lot with what was said before. Uh, and I'll try and zoom it up to um, a few thousand feet and look over this from a sort of geopolitical perspective. Clearly, in the last four, nearly five months, the, the thing that's dominated all of our concerns has been the Ukraine crisis and, and the response of 
Western states, but also um, Middle Eastern states, Asian states, um, to the position that Vladimir Putin has taken, to the assertion or reassertion, if you like, of NATO and Western power, the types of debates that we thought were gone in 1991 that seem to have, have re-emerged, and the ways in which the Middle East, but particularly the Gulf, has fallen into some of the old traps, but as much as has stayed the same, many things are also different. So I think given the centrality of global energy prices, uh, most of you I'm sure will have read your bills recently and found that you're paying significantly more for your gas and heating than you were only three months ago. Um, that of course has an immediate knock-on effect to the position of the Gulf states. The severity of the sanctions placed on um, Russian energy imports, the almost desperation for uh, Central European states to try and wean themselves off uh, oil and gas. And I think it was today, wasn't it, that Bulgaria uh, and another, maybe it was Romania, was, was um, cut off from Russian gas supplies, really begins to shape the debate in which the geopolitical strength of the Gulf, and this alludes to Dina's point about how the Gulf states are increasingly seeing their external interface with the world as more unitary because it does affect them all in similar ways, um, notwithstanding their notable disagreements. Um, they're starting to realize the geopolitical leverage that they have, but they're behaving in different ways. And I think this is a conversation which does not have a straight answer to it. And the way in which the, the, the Europeans and uh, the United States, but also the Chinese, um, react to the position of the Gulf states now is going to determine, I think, for at least the next five years, the centrality of the energy and geopolitical nexus in the Middle East, um, and bring back some old questions about the leverage of Saudi Arabia as the preeminent Arab, but also energy producing power, the importance of Iran and normalizing with Iran as a way to get some extra capacity online, the centrality of al Qataris. The gas debate is quite different from um, the refined crude debate. And of course, whilst there's a little bit of extra capacity in the oil debate, there isn't in the gas debate. And so the Qataris, I think, have very much been able to leverage that position. And funnily enough, of course, their removal of the moratorium on drilling in the uh, North Dome field in 2017 will pay big dividends in about three years time as people are looking for a sustained long-term solution to the problem of uh, Russian energy being taken off the market. So as a result, we have a situation in which the necessity of dealing with the Gulf states has become far, far more important than it ever has. Um, certainly under the Obama administration, there was a, a feeling at least that we need to get the nuclear deal over the line. Once that's sorted, the concerns of the Gulf states, albeit you know, a problem to be dealt with, were not central. They were not a tier one issue uh, for Washington to look at. Um, that was slightly changed in the Trump years because obviously Trump liked the highly personal way in which both he and his son-in-law interacted with the Gulf monarchs. There was a nexus or at least an intersection between uh, uh, money moving into markets uh, in both Europe and also North America uh, that benefited particularly Mr. Kushner. And so we have those relationships there. Some interesting relationships between uh, the UAE and Russia as well. So. That marked a period of intense interaction, some geopolitical changes on the back of that that led to the Abraham Accords. But now we have a more distant US administration that has not burnt its bridges with the Gulf, of course it hasn't, but has signaled to the Gulf that their security questions are not really of primary focus. Now that's changed a little bit because the particular role that the Gulf states have played as the issue of Vladimir Putin has become central is to effectively hedge and to say, listen, we, we don't want to pick sides. We're not interested um, in going to war against Russia. We're not interested in disrupting the one thing that makes us uh, be able to pay off our bank balances, which is the supply of oil and gas. And we don't want to be seen as potentially alienating uh, somebody who we've been engaging with for the last 10 years, which of course is Putin. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves that even though the Gulf states by and large disagreed with Vladimir Putin and his position on Syria, 
Mohammed bin Salman, the Qataris and the Emiratis would all engage with Putin when it came to energy prices. And they always managed to make that relationship work. And so as this coolness from the US has been felt across the Gulf, with the exception of Qatar, actually, I think it's fair to say that they've looked to Russia as an alternative. But of course, they're now scrambling to recalculate what their priorities are because the Russian military is clearly not very capable. Uh, the Russian economy is in free fall. And the main levers that the Russians had, which gave them the geopolitical influence that they basically bludgeoned um, into both Eastern Europe and also the Mediterranean basin, um, are no longer there. So the question is this. You've had for the last 15 months increasing frustration from Saudi Arabia and to some extent UAE, saying that the US is not with us, the US doesn't care about our geopolitical concerns. But at the same time, the way in which they hedged, which was to go towards Russia, which is now discredited, isolated from the international system, and China, which is currently in the midst of a zero COVID lockdown that it doesn't seem to want to wake up from, leaves the Gulf in a very strange position where they have a very, very fungible asset, and that is their energy and the production of their energy and their wealth, which everybody is looking for at the moment. And I think rather than say this is a, a, a replay of 1973, the main difference is of course that the Gulf states since the 70s learned a lesson that actually if you invested heavily in Western capitals, that gave you additional leverage. And I think that's something we have to be acutely aware of is that this is not just a narrow energy debate. The types of interactions and um, investments that have been made in Paris, in London, in Berlin, in Rome, in Washington, in New York, give the Gulf states that added lever uh, that they probably didn't have 50 years ago. Nevertheless, we are back to a very Cold War style debate, but one in which the Gulf states positions are quite unusual. And that's led to um, a very interesting policy, which is one largely of silence. And so you've had to the best of their abilities, with the exception of the Qataris who have openly criticized the Russian invasion of Ukraine and have openly stated time again that they, that they back the Ukrainian position, um, an attempt to be neutral. That has of course greatly angered uh, the Biden administration and it's angered some people in Europe as well. But the question is, is that sufficient enough to cause a further breakage in relations? Is that sufficient to cause some sort of rupture when it comes to the negotiations with Iran that Dina was outlining. And I think not. I think what you're seeing as well from Washington and also particularly from London at the moment is some pragmatism, some willingness to say, do you know what? There's really big questions that we've got to solve about geopolitical order. Yes, we've got some differences with the Gulf states, but frankly speaking, those are not big enough right now to cause a big rift in our relationship. So you're seeing some reassuring measures um, as you're all aware, the problem in Yemen has not gone away. Saudi Arabia tried to tie instability in Yemen to its security as a long-term oil provider. Now, that was a mistake. I think quite clearly, Saudi Arabia had the strongest card it's had in 50 years to play, bringing it right back to the center as a swing producer. It then tied that to a question about Yemen, which was not a geopolitical question. And if you notice, the Saudis backed away very quickly from pushing that line. What they did get, however, was a very fast response from the United States, which was to put Patriot missiles on that southern border. And so there were overt indications that the US was listening. The relationship wasn't good, but the US is doing what it needs to do to get um, the Saudis back online. And I think what we're increasingly beginning to see is a situation in which both sides realize there's no way out. They've got to deal with one another. You cannot, in the current geopolitical situation, go your own way. The Gulf states, as I've said before, don't have the ability to hedge as they would have liked. And both the Europeans, or at least the Western Europeans, uh, and the North Americans have also realized that actually now is not the time to be picking a fight when September is only six months away. We're going to need more gas. We're going to need more oil. The temperatures are going to go back down, and it's going to be a long, cold winter if we don't work this out. So we're in a moment of flux where both sides actually, for want of a better word, have calculated what their core interests in the other side is, which is interesting because Dina, myself, Jane have been in many, many roundtables over the last decade and a half where we've frankly been sidetracked down minutiae. We've got, you know, debating about tweets, about the performance of a 
local police chief in Dubai and all these things that get us all hot under the collar and frustrated. But actually what's happened in the last six months is that we've all remembered what it was that the other side needed from the other. And I think that's made it very, very clear. And actually what you're going to go to now, I think is a period of, I'm not gonna call it stability because the geopolitical situation at the moment is anything but stable. But I think with regards to Western uh, relationships with the Gulf states, you are going to go through a period of stability. Now, the joker in the pack there is of course Iran. I, I, I could not speak to whether that deal is gonna get over the line or not. You know, when I speak to Dina at one point, it's looking good, then it's not looking good, then it's looking good. So I can't predict what that's going to be like, but I do think that we'll see a period of calm, a period of understanding what both sides can bring to the table to, to aid the other's interests. And a little bit of the toning down of the rhetoric from the Jake Sullivan to the world. You've already seen this with both London and Paris that they're not bringing up some of the tough conversations um, that they would normally do um, in an effort to assuage the frustrations of, of the Gulf states. Now, the one that's gonna be interesting, and, I, and I'll just end it here, is the position with Qatar. Qatar has the World Cup coming up. This is the single biggest event that's ever happened in the Middle East. Um, you're gonna have well over a million people turning up. God forbid a new variant of Omicron won't turn up at that point, but we'll deal with that when we get there. The Qataris are coming under sustained criticism at the moment for their human rights record. And I do wonder whether they might not just play that as a bit of a lever in the coming months to say, hey, you know, we, we, we have a lot that we can offer. Uh, your infrastructure in Northern Europe is now basically relying on our goodwill and our outputs. Um, we'd like some of that criticism toned down. And so let's keep a close eye on, on where the media goes and where government rhetoric goes, because certainly if you look in the football community, football community has been very critical of the Qataris over the last couple of months. Um, and I think it's, it's been very interesting to see how that has escalated um, to very overt signals of dissatisfaction from players, pundits, but also politicians. And, and so I'd like to see how that plays out at the geopolitical level. Uh, and that's a question I, I can't yet answer. But I'd just like to return to sort of my main theme of the day, which is that there are aspects of Gulf geopolitics which look very similar to the 70s. Um, they are increasing in, in leverage and strength and scope, but there are also some things which are different. So let's not go back to a period of, say, the 70s, in which the, the relationship was purely utilitarian. I think there are some emotional relationships there. There are the divisions between the Gulf states themselves that make their nuances a little bit more complex. But otherwise, we're in for a very, very interesting period of uh, relationship building. And finally, we'll see what that looks like when China comes out of its COVID slump. That could also be a very big variable. Thank you very much, Michael. Now, we're running quite short of time for questions, which is really my fault as moderator, but I'm going to say it's your fault as speakers for being so interesting that I couldn't bear to interrupt you. So I'm just going to, to actually read out the questions for speed, that in particular, we have got a question from Chris Doyle at Cabu. Could you please tell us something about how you see the UK relations with the Gulf? I'll note also that Swadika wanted to know about the GCC response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which I think Michael has largely covered. But if anyone else wants to comment on that, please do. Uh, just be aware that I have to give each speaker a maximum of two minutes each because we are due to wrap up at three o'clock UK time. Uh, so I'm going to come back to Rafia to comment on the GCC relationship with the UK at present and looking forward. Uh, thank you. So um, as they say in the statements and everything that the, the relations between Oman uh, and of course the, uh, the Gulf states and UK is historic and old and, uh, but presently what I see that is the UK um, stepped back uh, and left, um, you know, the the scene and the Gulf states handling more to the United States and other um, and other countries, but mostly the United States. From my perspective and the issues that um, I focus on, I think UK um, has that history and understands, in fact, the communities and the the, the and the society at large in the Gulf state more than the US. And I think they can put more pressure on the issues I mentioned and other issues. Um, um, in order first, they 
uh, you know, there is the, the, the war in Yemen um, and there is, you know, uh, as this is when I went, why I, I mentioned the, uh, the war in Yemen because of the stability. I mentioned that they are stable, rich, um, you know, um, monarchies, but this stability is also now is, uh, you know, is relative. So UK can work region, regionally, um, you know, um, if um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, stabilizing and negotiation and um, negotiating with um, uh, regards to Yemen and Iran, um, although the United States uh, took over, but also can put pressure on other internal issues. When I said rich, um, um, I, I cannot ignore this, uh, the very difficult uh, economic situation in Oman, which led to protests last year, like uh, May last year, exactly one year ago. And I think um, Oman is uh, in jeopardy uh, to see instability internally because if, if uh, of the unemployment, Bahrain also is, you know, um, uh, facing the same difficulties. Um, Gulf state needs uh, to uh, need um, to have the cooperation, but UK can work with these countries in, to, um, I don't know, they know what they, what, what they should do, but a country like the UK, of course, can have a leverage and can do, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say put pressure, but can lead in certain situations, these countries to, um, uh, to, um, to go farther um, towards cooperation than competition and also to enhance their, you know, records in human rights and, uh, um, and em employment issues if they want to remain stable. Thank you. Let's go to Dina, final comment. Thank you. Thanks. I'll actually comment um, on, on Ukraine and, and leave the UK to, to Michael, who will know more about it than me. Um, and not that much to add, because obviously Michael's gone through it quite at, uh, at length, but... Um, I did want to say that I had uh, I, I spent a lot of time in the region over the last few weeks slash months, um, uh, just talking to a lot of people there. And what I did think was particularly interesting was that there was also a um, growing frustration uh, that they were happy to air, um, not just with the way that the U.S. was dealing with the crisis and, and with U.S. presence more generally, um, but almost being like a little bit more aggressive and talking about the fact that, you know, we are in a new Cold War, we're being asked to pick sides, and we don't want to be picking sides. It's, you know, this, why, why is the West doing this? We've, we've clearly, we've moved past the Cold War, why are we back in it? So there was that first. Um, and then the second statement was, uh, was even more aggressive. It was like, you know, that the West is being incredibly hypocritical right now. It has spent um, the better part of the, you know, the last 10, 20 years telling us that we shouldn't be um, getting involved in, in crises in the region. Uh, and then you have, uh, you have them asking us to send weapons to Ukraine when they're telling us we shouldn't be sending weapons um, to countries in our own region. And you have somebody like the U UK Foreign Secretary that gets up on TV and says, you know, we encourage uh, British fighters to go and fight in Ukraine after, um, again, the West has been telling the Gulf that they shouldn't be getting involved in conflicts in the region. So there's, um, there was, there's also real frustration, I think, amongst the Gulf Arab states about uh, the way that, that the West is dealing with this conflict versus the way it's dealt with conflicts in the Middle East region. Um, I, uh, I, I don't know, I can't predict which way the relationship with the US is going to go, uh, and it may very well end up um, in exactly the situation that Michael outlined, where things will end up being in this like uneasy calm because they feel they need each other in a way that hasn't necessarily been evident over the course of the last few months or years. Um, but I do think that if that's the case, it'll be a really, really uncomfortable uh, uh, feeling of you know having to deal with the U.S. at least on the on the part of the Gulf Arab states, but even on the part of the uh, of the U.S. I just think that that relationship. Um, it will endure, I agree, it will absolutely endure, but I just, I don't think it will endure as perhaps easily as it did in the past. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Michael for a closing comment. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's true. The days of, um, you know, the Bush two administration and its intense, you know, 
closeness with the Saudis are gone and they're, and they're not coming back. And even if Trump were to be reelected in 2024, things will be significantly different as a result. You know, the, if, if you look at the geopolitical positioning of the US, actually from Obama to Trump to Biden, the, 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 the sort of pathway has been actually quite clear, which is it's just a US recalibration, more or less. It, you know, Trump was a bit topsy-turvy and he tweeted a lot. Let's see what happens now. Elon Musk owns Twitter. But um, generally speaking, there was there was a sort of a steady state movement away. And those interests are, broadly speaking, become becoming more clear to everybody. And Ukraine has made that uh, ever more clear. I think it's worth at this point reminding ourselves just how bad U.S.-Turkish relations got. And actually, they're now coming back to a slightly better footing. Um, and at one point, I think they really, really were numerous op-eds saying, look, the Turks need to go, they need to leave NATO. And funnily enough, you know, geopolitics or politics in general has a way of, of showing you actually, uh, you don't know what it, you've got till it's gone. And, and, and there are tensions, they are difficult. It's not going to be easy, but I think for both sides, you know, they're, they're many decades into this marriage and it's, it's not the happiest one, but there are still reasons for them to be there. Um, as for the UK, we don't have the luxury of talking in the way that the US National Security Advisor does. We can't make open criticisms of the uh, of the Gulf states in the same way and, and get away with it. Um, the relationship with all six is pretty good. We're engaging on a number of different fronts, be it economic, be it cultural, be it social. Um, we've obviously had Prime Minister Johnson going to the region recently. That, from what I heard, was actually a fairly positive set of meetings. It wasn't just about pumping more oil, which I agree was not a successful ask, but there were other parts of the relationship which were strengthened as a result. The UK is doubling down on trying to get uh, Vision 2030 achieved. Now, I have no idea if that's going to happen or not. It's a pretty big ask, and, and we all know, particularly Jane knows the economics of Saudi well, but if we can make that a partial success, I suppose that's, that's not a bad thing. The relationship with Qatar is particularly strong. Um, so at the moment, I would say, broadly speaking, for, for the UK, um, whenever the US opens up a bit of daylight between themselves and the Gulf, uh, that's usually a time when the UK sneaks in through the back door and, and gets a little bit more for itself. And I think that's fairly standard behavior for the Brits, and it has been since... Uh, 1971. I think we forget that actually um, during the period of uh, the Reagan Thatcher era, where the US and the UK were supposedly, you know, tied at the hip, the greatest uh, British Saudi arms deal was signed because the Americans wouldn't sell F-15s to the Saudis. So we snuck in the back door, even when the relationship was close. Now the relationship between the UK and, and, and the Biden administration isn't so close. I don't think there's going to be any sleep lost if we if we do a little bit more business. Now, from an ethical perspective, um, it's not nice. It's not easy. The Gulf states are not always the perfect partners, frankly, let's be honest. Um, but from a UK perspective, what I see is a very hard headed approach to dealing with things like the cost of living crisis um, and to trying as best they can to ride out the storm uh, politically till 2023 and 24. And the Gulf states play a role in that. So you're not going to see much in the way of upturning the apple cart from the British. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. And just to conclude, you know, I think it's so valuable to have discussions with scholars and civil society who are from the Gulf and working in the Gulf so that we can have a more holistic picture of what these relations should mean, which isn't just defined by the, the immediate concerns of government. So I'm really happy Kabu was able to organise this meeting today. Their next meeting is going to be on 5th of May, looking at at Libya. So for fans of Western hypocrisy and complicated interventions, there'll be plenty to dig into there. And please do consider making a donation, becoming a member of Taboo. It is a small charity putting on lots of great work for free. Um, thanks all of you for coming. Hope to see you for another event very soon. Enjoy the rest of your day.